Today, we are honored to have two speakers with us to share their thoughts on the market and positioning going forward. First and foremost, we have Mr. Ang Bengguan, the Head of Fund Management from Hong Leong Islamic Asset Management, Sanya Berhad, External Fund Manager for Hong Leong Dana Makmo and Hong Leong Dana Maruf. Mr. Ang Bengguan joined HLAM in February 2021 and was transferred to Hong Leong uh, Islamic Asset Management on 1st September 2021 as Head of Fund Management. Mr. Ang has more than eight years experience in global treasury markets, dealing with money markets, foreign exchange and derivatives. He was a fund manager and investment strategist for an institutional buy-side investor, managing close to one trillion ringgit in asset under management. He also spent over four years in capital markets, driving private debts, corporate restructuring, and commercial real estate private debt funds, and managing emerging markets public debt portfolio. Mr. Ang holds Bachelor of Science in Biohealth Sciences and Masters in Economics from University of Malaya. He had completed the Leadership Development Program from National University of Singapore in 2018. He holds a PKMC license and has also obtained his CMSIR license from the SC since 7 May 2021. Our second speaker is Encik Azla Azizuddin, the Deputy CEO and Head of Business Development of MIDF Amana Asset Management, Perhat. Encik Azla has more than 30 years' experience in the stockbroking and fund management industry. Prior to joining MIDF Amana, he was a General Manager of Amara Raya JMF Asset Management, Sanyam Perhat, managing a total fund size of 7.5 billion ringgit. Prior to that, he was a regional corporate finance leader at International Eurobond Consultant, IEC, leading a corporate finance team covering the Southeast Asia region, namely Indonesia and Thailand. Nsik Aslan's earliest things include as head of investment for Ahpin Fund Management, managing a 350 million ringgit investment portfolio, ranging from unit trust, corporate, government agencies and insurance companies, head of research and business development at Afin Trust Management, licensed dealers representative of KN Kananga Bahad and analyst for Capital Corp Securities. Anji Azlan graduated with a Bachelor degree in Economics Finance from the University of Tasmania, Hobart, Australia. He obtained a CMSR license in 2003. Let's start with the first question, uh, Mr. Ang. The Fed rate cut 50 basis point has finally come after the rates have stayed elevated at 5.25% to 5.5%. How are the latest Fed interest rate cut affecting the bond market and equity markets in the US and globally? Well, um, thank you, Kim, uh, for the elaborate introduction uh, of both of us, Jay Aslan and myself. Uh, it's privileged privilege here to uh, share our views here. So basically, um, yes, the Fed has come out with an X and slash the Fed funds rate by 50 basis point. But basically, this is not uh, something of unusual here because we have experienced this uh, way back in 2000 that we observed that S&P uh, index rallied after the first 50 basis point Fed funds cut in September 2007. And it climbed higher by another 5.8%. So S&P index only reacted reacted negatively after the second Fed rate cut in December uh, 2007 by punching another 9.2% and another decline by 9.6% uh, after the December cuts. I mean, basically, you can see that the equities market uh, moved uh, in a little bit of laggard right, for the US side as compared to uh, Malaysia side, which I will share later. For Malaysia equities, uh, this is more towards a forward-looking uh, index rather than the, uh, the US where S&P tend to be the uh, laggard as compared to uh, the Malaysia. So you can see the FPM KLCI index right, moved right, nine months ahead right, back in 2007 when uh, OPR was cut in September 2008. So when OPR was further aggressively eased from 3.25% to 2% in first quarter 2009, right? So FBM KLCI has already plunged by close to 40%, nine months ahead before when OPR cut aggressively. So essentially, in terms of the Malaysia laggards, right, and leads, right, so you can see that US uh, market, right, tend to be um, 
of a laggard uh, has compared to the central bank side, where else uh, the FBM KLCI index tend to be a leading index as compared uh, to the monetary policy makers as well. So uh, for the US Treasury side, the time lag is a little bit much more uh, shorter. So basically for US Treasury bond yields, right, the directional yield movement tend to be in tandem with more uh, Fed funds rate cut expectations. Uh, when Fed aggressively eased from 5.25 to 2% back then in 2007 prior to the GFC. But similarly to FBM KLCI, the time lag between uh, the market lead versus the monetary policy decision makers tend to be uh, quite shorter. Uh, as you can see, in terms of the MGS benchmark yield, right, they will react first to OPR rate cut uh, by plunging another 160 basis points a quarter ahead before the OPR was aggressively reduced from 3.5 to 2% during the GFC side of it. So you can see that different markets will react differently uh, based on policymakers' expectations and also based on what are their decision-making based on prior meetings and, and the speeches that are coming. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Ang. Uh, over to you, Anshi Aslan. Okay, I will, I will thank you for the introduction, uh, Kim. And Mr. Ang, thank you very much for the data, the, the, the data-driven event kind of thing. Okay, so from our point of view, yes, uh, the recent rate cuts, what happened was uh, in this cycle of the uh, in, uh, inverse relationship between the ring, uh, the ringgit and the yields and stuff like that, what we saw was, uh, if I could if I could sum it up, uh, right now is driven by data rather than event, yeah. Previously, it was more event like during COVID time. You know, so it's, uh, sorry, it was an event uh, during COVID. The yields are coming off, and everybody started throwing down the uh, all, all the investment. You saw the market coming off. It's, that's 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 event driven. Okay, right now, when you look back at the uh, this is for example Malaysian ringgit against the US dollar. You know, you saw that big disparity in between that when they start cutting, when the news started saying that, oh, they're going to cut rates, up, up and coming rates. So, you know, the data is going to come out soon because U.S. is like that. Previously, it was just, uh, okay, uh, they don't announce anything and it happens. Nowadays, they give you foresight. Yeah, they give you foresight first and they say, okay, we're going to cut. We, there's a possibility that we're, we're going to cut this, 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 this and this. However, it's not driven by event. It's driven by Okay, we see this data first. If it comes out, yes, we will cut. We see this data. So now what I, what uh, we see is majority of the data that comes out shows that we are not going, US is not going into a recession. Okay, so how do you support that notion or thesis saying that US is not going to uh, go into a recession? How do you support that? You, of course, you, you have to reduce your rate, right? So hence, uh, that's, that's why when 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 I wasn't surprised when they say, oh, okay, we're gonna do, do another fifty basis cuts, you know. So now it's about four point seven five. So it's, it's it's data driven, okay. So it's not event driven anymore. I mean, this cycle, right? So going forward, also for and then we saw that once the the I mean, the the US the 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 the, the Feds are, are saying are telling us we're gonna cut our rates. So you guys better do something about your dollar strength. You better do something about your ringgit strength, you know. Except for Bank of Japan, lah, you know, whatever they did in August was a bit different, lah, right? So, what we see right now is it's they have already given us foresight. So it's how we react upon it. Okay, so it's data. Then, true enough, data came out. So, and okay, sorry, I think I might just I'm I'm gonna skip. I mean, I mean, I'm gonna go forward to this recent uh, this about the election between uh, Kamala Harris and Trump, you know, because. You know, both of them are drive. For me, they are drivers for growth in economy. I, no new poly, new no new president is going to come up and say, "Ah, oh, the economy is going to bad. We're going to be in a recession, etc." So, from my from my point of view, if whoever's been elected, even uh, Kamala, they still have. This is my point of view. They still have to cut rates towards the end of the year. You know, so you know that is coming. They've given enough hints and foresights already. So it's how the market reacts. It's not as if it's a is a is a oh event kind of thing that happens and stuff. It's not anymore for this cycle. Yeah. So from my point of view, you saw the Dow Jones a new high, you know, and you saw our market also 
uh, going. To, I mean, you saw the inflows uh, from our research side. We saw three year to date three billion worth of foreign investors coming into Malaysia. So hence, you saw the ringgit going at, uh, up to four seventeen today, or for something until today. Yeah. So th those kind of things that it's already with the current with the current market conditions, it's it's already foretold. Yeah, they, they, they give us advance notice. Is how the fund, how us as investors would react to that. So indeed, what what happened to our market? Our market is uh, hovering at one one six six zero one one seventy now. That is going to be the reaction. We knew it. The US is uh, uh, slowly creeping up, and uh, I mean uh, into that space where another high over another high on a on a monthly basis. So you know. The economics is going. The the economics is getting better, and all countries have to support that by improving rates. This this is post COVID thing. This is a post COVID thing. Yeah. So yeah, that's my uh, that's my answer to that question number one. All right. Hey, uh, thank you, Andre Aslan and Mr. Ang. So basically, uh, what we hear from Mr. Ang is that uh, there have been a lot of data in the past that support that uh, following a rate right. cut, uh, whether it's in the US or whether it's in Malaysia, is generally uh, supportive for the market. Uh, especially, I think, uh, during uh, the GFC in 2008, the market, of course, uh, the, the, the correction uh, happened initially, right? Uh, because of the global recession worries and whatnot. But following that, the market has since recovered when the market started to appreciate the benefits of rate cut. And this trial, uh, like what Anjay Aslan has mentioned, that uh, US markets are actually uh, approaching uh, historical high levels uh, following the rate cut, right? I think that is also generally very supportive. But what we need to monitor further is, of course, Number one is the data, right? And number two, of course, is some of the events that gonna drive the uh, market movements going forward. And since uh, just now Anjit Azlan are talking about uh Anjit Azlan uh, was talking about uh, presidential election, maybe Mr. Ang would like to add more on the US presidential election. A uh, recent poll by the economist showed that Harris uh, leading Trump by about four mm. percentage point. Uh, mm. But certainly the numbers can fluctuate leading up to the election and the actual outcome may differ from the poll predictions. So mm. how should investors position ahead of the U.S. election? Should we put more on mm. fixed income? Should we put more in equities or by country? How, how should we position? So basically, this presidential election uh, is a very close call uh, polling. I mean, basically, you can see, right, that most of the posters are calling a neck-to-neck -neck with only a few uh, decisions to be made by the better ground states. That include Pennsylvania, Michigan, uh, Nevada, uh, all these states, right, tend to be on uh, a swing states, right? So irrespective of it, um, we think that the market is still focusing right now on the corporate earnings and also the potential of the Fed rate cuts and how much uh, Fed rate cuts is going to happen in November and December, whether it could be a 50 basis point cut or a 75 basis point cut. But basically, from based of historical, right, if history would be a lesson to us all, right, that um, previously presidential election years, right, versus non-presidential election years, right, uh, asset allocation of 60-40 returns, right, shows no stati statistical differences. So, for example, for president election from 1984 to, 20, uh, to 2020, right, the S&P 500 index, right, annualized volatility is about 16.5% in the 100 days before the presidential election, and 16% for 100 days after an election, both of which are lower than 18% uh, annualized volatility for the full time period. So basically is that um, irrespective of whether, whether there's election or not, right, within the first 100 days or the after 100, or before the 100 days, right? So essentially it's, it's more towards uh, you understand what uh, your investment style is. You continue to invest, stay invested, and always be disciplined in terms of your investment approach. So basically, uh, that is the way to achieve because these sometimes these presidential elections are tend to be noises. But overall, it, once a presidential election is 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 determined and we know who's the president, the long term policy rollout is uh, more important, and we see what kind of policy 
that will be coming in uh, for the next inline president as well. Maybe I pass it to Jay Aslan, who, who has uh, a, a different observation then. Yeah, uh, no, no, I think, okay, uh, given Trump's track record, yes, uh, even, though, even though now he seems to be looked as if he's lagging behind or whatever, he's known to end the last minute kind of thing, he will pull something out of his head. You know how how Trump is, right? So very vocal, very uh, 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 is coincidental kind of guy. You know, he'll come up with something that nobody would think about. Okay, but in terms of economic policy, no matter how much previously when Trump got, he said, "I want to build a wall. I want to stop migration." Blah blah blah. Nothing happened, right? Nothing happened. So, but what I think, what both of them are striving for is. Uh, for the uh, economic growth and economic stimulus for both. What's going to be the different, what, what's going to differentiate is what their relationship, relationship is with China. Yeah, one. Second, with Russia. So that's still at the back of their mind. So who's got the political will to 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 to, to let, uh, you know, at the moment there's tariff in China, etc. So those are those are crucial numbers that we should observe. Okay, being 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 uh being uh asia being the biggest uh, uh suppliers of uh, uh like uh, ev batteries like uh, raw materials for all the cars in the us tesla and stuff like that hence if if the tariff still the tariff still uh, happens in china there might be some there's still going to be some uh, opportunity for us asians especially when you see uh tesla coming up when you see uh even though say EV is going to be dead, no, it's not. From my point of view, it's not. Because decarbonization, the governments nowadays have to do something about uh, earth warming and stuff like that. So each government is aiming for 2050 uh, decarbonization, 100, uh, 100, uh, 100% decarbonization. So they must do something from now on. So both presidents, whoever is going to be president, have to implement that policy. right? So governments have to spend. And Asia, especially if you're looking at Asia Pac, you're looking at uh, we are the biggest suppliers to them, to Europe and to the US. See, every part. Now, neither is Korea, is Japan, or or even Asia, Malaysia. So we 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 are we are uh, trying to balance. If you are an investor, in America, whoever becomes the president of the US will have to go to spend a lot, spend on this uh, decarbonization and you know all all those poly environment policies going forward. So I'm looking at from that angle. So wh whoever wins, us uh, as, as Asians, as Asian investors, must be aware that they're still going to spend on, on those kind of investments. Yeah? So I think the market is, is good to go for the long, uh, for, for the medium, medium term. Yeah? The rates will be stabilized. I think they, they, I, I believe the cuts are not going to be very aggressive going into next year. I mean, that's my point of view. OPR, Malaysian OPR are going to be stable. Yeah. So the market should be better than what it was for the past two years. Lah, because this is post, post COVID story, a lot of demand now. Yeah. And they can already implement whatever the policies they had in 2019, 2018. Yeah. Regarding how to expand, expand the local businesses and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's my, that's my point of view. Yeah. I mean, Kim, uh, just adding on to Aslan's notes, right? So another important thing is that uh, this data also shows that uh, from Vanguard, right, that for 60-40 asset allocation, right, the annualized compounded return, right, is about 8.7% on the presidential election years, which covered yep. about 41 periods versus a 7.7% on a non-presidential election year. So irrespective of it, whether it's a presidential election year or otherwise, right, the returns will almost be similarly and just to uh, stack on uh, Aslan's uh, additional comments on whichever who won, right? the most important thing we also need to look at is the U.S. fiscal debt. Because uh, yeah. this week, uh, they have they are still discussing on the stopgap measures in terms of keep uh, rolling the government officers uh, on the ball. So this is one of the measures that they need to look at because if they don't roll over a legislation that keep the government function running, so we will have another government shutdown uh, on uh, 1st October as well. And more importantly is that the debt ceiling conversation will have to be raised. 
and uh, whichever take the seat of the presidential presidential side, right? So basically, they would have to discuss whether they would raise the debt ceiling limit uh, comes early January of 2025. And that is a very deep-seated conversation because we remember that Trump also having this problem, right, of trying to keep the government function rolling uh, uh, back then, right? Yeah, and it shut down I, I, for the longest period, right? Yeah, yeah. So that is, whichever take the presidential place, right, we had to look at the debt ceiling and the, the conversation of whether... Uh, the the government treasury side is getting more indebted. And why is it that we keep on buying US treasuries where the fiscal deficit is at astronomical high, the debt to GDP is at elevated levels, and we got certain structural areas whereby the consumers are feeling the pinch right now with all those mortgages debt and also the credit card debt as well. All right. Uh, thank you, Mr. Ang and Andre Aslan. So looks like the market dynamics can be very uh, fluid. Uh, I think investors would continue to, they will need to monitor the developments for the US presidential election. And just now, Mr. Ang also mentioned about the debt ceiling deal. And of course, uh, the Fed's uh, rate uh, decision going forward is also crucial to monitor. But of course, like what uh, Mr. Ang mentioned earlier, I think it's right that uh, investors uh, whether they they are going to position into uh, equities or bonds or a 60-40 kind of asset allocation, it totally depends on their uh, preference, right? their risk profile, uh, and the risk management is also very, very important. And since we are talking about China, right? Uh, just now, Anjit Azna also mentioned about uh, the geopolitical uh, relationship between the US and China, China and Russia, or m m maybe US and Russia, things like that. So uh, maybe we start from uh, Mr. Ang, then followed by Anjit Azna. Uh, what's your opinion on the geopolitical situation uh, post the US presidential election? Do you think... Uh, the trade relationship between uh, those boys, right, will escalate or de-escalate? Do we see more wars in the Middle East, things like that? What are your thoughts on this? Okay, so uh, maybe I'll start first, then maybe to ask Aslan can you pitch in. Uh, that essentially is for China, right, the relationship with China and US is particularly very complex, right, because uh, they are the both biggest uh, importers and exporters as well too of goods in the world. So essentially is that uh, it depends on whoever wins the presidential election because I think Trump is much more forefront in terms of uh, the introduction of the tariffs and, and, and having uh, to impose a higher tariff uh, for China as compared to other countries, right? So basically is that that is the key thing that we need to look at because I think somewhere in the middle of this year also President uh, Biden also introduced some tariffs uh, on EVs and restrictions on parts of EVs as well too. And in, in 2025 and 2026, they were going to introduce uh, additional uh, restrictions in terms of capital goods and e electronics and telcos as well in terms of the tariffs. So uh, for China side, I think China has recently rolled out a very huge uh, monetary policy uh, stimulus uh, that was just recently this week introduced uh, with PBOC, uh, National Financial Regulatory Administration, which is the regulator of uh, the financial sector and also the securities regulator, the CSRC also. They, they introduced a broad uh, swath of packages, which includes a triple R cut or the reserve requirements uh, rate cut of 50 basis point that released about 1 trillion of liquidity. They also cut the seven-day uh, RRR uh, by another 20 basis point and lower the uh, median lending facility by another 30 basis point and loan prime rate and deposit rate by 20 to 25 basis point. This is the biggest monetary policy packages that ever introduced by China since 2005. So basically, they also look to ease uh, the down payment ratio because they acknowledge that the problem, the systemic race is from the property, uh, Chinese, uh, Chinese property uh, sector itself. So they also ease the down payment ratio to 15% for second home buyers uh, from as originally 25%. 
they also uh, come up with the re-lending facility for property inventory purchase to cover 100% of the loan principal from originally 60%. And more importantly is to stimulate uh, the equity, local equity markets, right? They have introduced the total equity swap and stock buyback lending facility amounting to close to 500 billion yuan, which can be expanded further to 1.5 trillion yuan. And basically, it, it gives the stockbrokers, the local investment bankers' house to swap in their stocks or to or for, for companies, public listed companies, to buy back their com uh, and boost their shareholders' returns, right? Basically, at a rate of very attractive, it's two and a quarter percentage point interest rate per annum. And they also acknowledge that banks also, uh, because they have lowered the rates, right? So they also introduced the recapitalization plan as well. I mean, this is a part of parcel of trying to acknowledge the banks that they have done their national service, trying to absorb all these uh, property loans issues in their balance sheet. And also this uh, recapitalization enable the big banks right, to at least absorb a little bit in terms of their provisioning and the impairment losses of their asset quality itself. And also to buffer a little bit of net interest margin, lower net interest margin going forward. So essentially, that is a large one. And therefore, we are I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm turning more of uh, from a dervish China to a more neutral and constructively positive on China. Uh, but I, I will need to see the rollout and the mechanism and, 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 and the plans that they are going to introduce uh, to uh, the China, China markets as well. Thank you. Uh, sorry, if, if, if I could add to that. Yeah. I mean, I mean that, there's no fact that Mr. Ang came up with, which is I totally agree with. I mean, for... For central bank to come up uh, to to have 113 billion US dollars liquidity support, right? It's it's not funny, okay? So I know now they're serious about not uh, because because they are afraid of missing that five percent target they were they were, they, were, they were trying to achieve. So hence, if 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 you're acting in in that in that way, so you so you see how serious the government is. So I'm like Mr. Ang, I'm neutral. I know they've came up. There's 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 there shouldn't be any more downside for the Chinese market. From my point of view, yeah, and then we can see more towards. Uh, I'm more bullish, you know, in the short term, and we'll see how after that how 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 it plateaus and become a serious upturn like what uh what what the US is going through right now. So, given that fact that both of them, they're, they're like brothers and sister gado. I mean, having a fight lah, you know. I want to put tariff here, but both need each other. To be honest, to both need, need each other in terms of economic, in terms of market move, movements, the bond trading. So, if you're willing to spend that much to 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 actually boost up your market, uh, revive your, I mean, the overhanging uh, property issues, you know. So that that means that they they are willing to actually, you know. But to do that, they must stop what, whatever you are doing in terms of tariff and stuff like that, you know. So there must be a win-win situation. I think. I think this is the way that I'm. I'm. I'm pretty bullish about China at the moment, lah. Despite whatever people say about it, yeah. Then, okay, for the Middle East, you know, there's a good because Trump is a nationalist. He doesn't care whatever happened overseas, right? I want to cut my tariff. I want to improve my local economy. Kamala is not. Kamala more. She. She. From my point of view, she's more of a regional. She. She overlooks the regional. So I think there could be something. Brewing about the uh, Palestine and 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 the and the Israeli state, you know, there must be something going on. I think, but Ka Kamala, of course, she supports the Israeli economy. That that's one thing we know, yeah. And but Trump doesn't seem to be, you know, that's our point of view. So we'll see the geo geopolitically, even though it doesn't impact much of the market, but that's the way that we look at it, yeah. All right, that's about it. Okay, uh, thank you, Mr. Ang and Anji Asan. I think what we can agree is that uh, after the Fed's uh, rate cut, right, uh, China is doing the right move in the sense that they are now using their monetary policy too to, right. uh, in fact, boost the uh, economy, right, to achieve the so-called around 5% GDP target, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I think yesterday, the announcement on the share buyback, uh, the company can do the share buyback using very, very cheap interest rate. I think that is very innovative. Uh, 
And furthermore, uh, we will continue to monitor uh, what is going to happen next, especially the property sector. So the implementation, like what Mr. Ang mentioned earlier, yeah, is the key. But one key risk that we need to monitor, of course, is the geopolitical situation, right? Like what Nchi Asan mentioned earlier, I think is pretty true. So uh, net net uh, looks like uh, it's still uh, a good uh, opportunity to look at the market right now. And coming back to Malaysia, uh, we all noticed that the ringgit has been performing very strongly recently from the lowest point in April. It had appreciated by, I think, more than 15% against the US dollar as of uh, this afternoon, right? It's barely touched the 4.11 level, right? While a stronger ringgit may benefit importers, it could be less advantageous for the exporter. And investors with foreign market exposure might also face challenges. Uh, Mr. Ang, how do you think the recent strength of the ringgit is impacting, uh, number one, the business decision, and number two, the investment decision? Okay, the ringgit appreciation would be a positive uh, for the economy as well. Um, that basically that uh, the inflationary pressures right, arising from the imported prices uh, will be somewhat eased. So it has lifted a little bit of the central bank's work in terms of tackling uh, inflationary pressures. Right? And it's also to trust uh, the ringgit right, into the investors' spotlight because right now we can see a lot of investors' flows coming in. And basically is that... Uh, they usually invest in our capital markets, but the more important thing that they are focusing is more towards the ringgit appreciation because we know that the currency appreciation or depreciation is faster than the asset uh, appreciation or you uh, you pick up uh, on the local markets as well. And this is coupled with uh, various incentives. I think the government is trying to strike when the iron is hot and they introduced this, um, the family office uh, incentive scheme down south on the forest city. So basically, that would attract a lot of uh, financing support to MSN, um, medium, small, and, and enterprises and the new economy related to these uh, uh, family offices as well. So you can see that it is estimated that this uh, family office incentive scale will, be, will bring in at least close to 4 to 11 billion of ringgit of inflows uh, from uh, foreign investors, which also includes the positive effects on uh, creation of skill employment as well as the services that is uh, providing this uh, sector. However, we think that there's a downside risk to ringgit appreciation or aggressive appreciation as well because uh, we, we tend to look at uh, basically the exports value of the ringgit itself. So it tend to make Malaysia products uh, so uh, globally right, tend to be less competitive. And, be, and, and this will affect a little bit on the, in terms of the trade performance uh, because the, tips, uh, the terms of trade will favor more towards the import value versus the export value. And additionally, uh, this would also encourage uh, for corporates to take this opportunity to convert a lot of their uh, FX, their ringgit, and look into elsewhere. So basically, is that it will increase temporarily uh, the ringgit uh, liquidity in the system. Have you have seen that? Uh, basically, that Ben Nagara has been conducting a lot of mopping up in uh, in in the system itself. Uh, the average is about closer to about. Uh, 40 billion, 50 billion. Now it's up north above 50 billion of mopping up uh, of, of liquidity in the system already. So um, yeah, but this will definitely be offset by the dollar appreciation, which tend to provide a certain uh, buffering offsetting effect, right? So that we don't have uh, the oversupply of ringgit, right? That would cause an inflationary pressure upward for uh, the domestic economy. Okay, from... From my point of view, sorry, Kim, I just I'm, I'm just jumping in into what I'm timing whatever Mr. Mr. Ang is saying regarding the family office kind of thing, where it's it's when when Singapore did it, so I think we should take our our our, our cue from Singapore as well, you know, the the, the, the zero tax kind of thing. However, however, it's a double edged sword, you know, because uh, you get China now being uh, told by Big Brother, uh, sorry, you, you, Singapore being told by the Big Brother, you know. You got illegal money coming in into China. Please clamp them down. Please put in policies now. Now they have to react to that. Okay, so Malaysia should also take heed to that. That yes, you're giving zero tax and stuff like that, but you're inviting unnecessary kind of uh, attraction from all these monies that's going on 
uh, all over the uh, transferring from all over the world and stuff like that. No, it sounds it sounds good. Yes, we are attracting all these foreign investors and stuff like that. However, to tighten the we should already be already tightening the policies regarding who is investing in it, who's opening the uh, the family's office. You know, how are they managing it, and whose money that's coming in? Okay, so you know we should we should, we should, we should learn from that, which is good yeah. for us actually. But yeah. when you say about ringgit appreciation, mm. uh, from my from uh, from my uh, client, uh, looking at my clients' focus regarding uh, mm. their feedback to me regarding improved uh, ringgit strengthening when they were investing when the ringgit was uh, weak, you know, and then now they they exit, they they, they lost about fifteen percent or sixteen uh, percent of that. However, it's been made up by whatever they made overseas. You know, they they made some easily about twenty five percent to twenty three percent, twenty three to twenty five percent last year. So whatever the, the the ringgit appreciated, so they lost that amount. However, if you weigh it in and out, net net, I think they still is in an advantage rather than a disadvantage. Doesn't matter which 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 kind of uh, strategies you're looking at the bonds or whether uh, or looking at the equities, but they still net net off. They didn't make as much as the what they're supposed to make, like if they invested at a lower ringgit. <laughs> Oh, uh, if they hedge, right? Ah, um, uh, yeah, uh, correct. Yeah. You're right, you're right, you're right. Okay, Kim, that's all I have to say about this. Okay, sure. So, uh, looks like uh, the Ringgit uh, recent up performance is also driven by the portfolio flows. I, I think Ajit Aslan, uh, in the middle of uh, round table, he also mentioned about three billion of equity flows uh, from the year to date. Uh, if we look at the bond flows as well, I think I don't have the number for September. I think in August, uh, we see about big billion of inflows for the bond market, uh, Malaysia bond market. So it has been very, very uh, impressive, right? Uh, looking ahead, uh, we all know that budget 2025 is coming, right? Uh, on October 18. Uh, Mr. Ang, what sectors will likely benefit from the budget and what sectors should we avoid Awaiting for better clarity. Uh, okay, so so for a turn, right? Maybe I'll let Chi Aslan Aslan to start first. Uh, as oh, I, as oh. I always, uh, I keep start. I, so uh, let me look into my crystal ball a bit. To, yeah. Okay. I I think I think Mr. Ah, uh, uh, GLCs will be making a comeback. Yeah, uh, that's because the government has to be uh, to be seen as uh, spending fiscally. Yeah, to to to, to improve the economy. I mean, to sort of sustain the economy. It's not that we're doing anything bad because our CPI improved, yeah, slight, uh, slight, uh, sorry, our CPI improved slightly. However, in terms of the overall economy, there's still much to do about government spending and fiscal spending and stuff like that. So I think GLCs will, the mega projects are coming back. However, in terms of, I think it'll be more scrutinized by uh, the PM, yeah, uh, the, the the PM department. That's that's what I I can foresee that. So we're still uh we're still looking at like data centers. Yeah, we're still looking at um uh, uh health healthcare services. We're still focusing on that. So maybe uh the GLCs which have these kind of connections might be our focus for next uh for the budget. Yeah, we see may, maybe uh I don't know tax improvements or or whatever. I can I can't. Say on behalf of the government uh, because they can come up with uh, surprises which we don't know. Uh, yeah. So Stang, that's all I have to say about the budget, Mr. Ang. I can't say much. <laughs> yeah. Any wish list for you, Mr. Ang, in a budget? Yeah, I, I agree with Jay Aslan that basically uh that is more towards the GLICs and the GLC is driven, right? But we also need to look at uh, what kind of tax scheme that is coming up, right? Because there are conversations about whether the government would introduce new new tax or otherwise and, and what happened to our uh, budget announcement on the luxury tax right announcement yeah. uh, whether it would be implemented or, or otherwise and also how do we tax the capital for capital appreciation tax itself so there are there are a few things or a few mechanism that we need to look at in terms of uh, the government's uh, wish list and how they're going to roll out these taxes and also importantly is that, that what kind of subsidy reform that they are looking at, right? So I, I think basically the diesel one has been removed. I think uh, the prices of chicken and egg also, the subsidies also has been removed. But uh, what's going to affect much and in focus right now is 
uh, how do they going to tackle the uh, subsidy reform for the RON95. I think that is quite crucial because that is used by most of the retailers and especially by us. So how how would they roll out the implementation? Uh, whether and, and and then the targeted scheme right based on the uh, Padu registration, how do we how do they address uh, the targeted subsidy scheme uh, and this incentive side given towards the B40 side? I think uh, going forward, uh, the budget will be friendly towards the B40 side of it. Uh, M40, uh, less of it, uh, basically. And, and T20s, of course, they will have to look at more taxes coming in. Uh, but essentially, it will be more B4, B40 centric. And uh, definitely, it will be more towards the, those uh, that class as well. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. An, Mr. Ang and Andre Aslan. So looks like uh, the budget 2025 is the upcoming key event that uh, we as a Malaysian investor need to monitor. And of course, uh, whether uh, it's, uh, how should I put it? Uh, I think we, we, we should also uh, focus on the, uh, I think the budget 2025 is relevant to the long-term goals that the government has set earlier, I think to recall in the truck Malaysia plan, midterm review, things like that. I think they are also targeting uh, to 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 bring the long term uh fiscal deficit to GDP to three percent, uh in the longer term. So I think uh we won't be surprised to see uh maybe more taxes, right? Uh subsidy reforms like what Mr. Ah and Anjay Asta has mentioned earlier, and coupled with uh the rollout of uh Ron ninety five uh rationalization. I think that's also a key uh focus to look at. But what is what is uh, almost certain is that uh, likely the budget uh, following the Madani framework, it will likely to benefit the B40. So uh, probably, you know, consumer sectors, right, uh, will be the key beneficiary and together with the recent uh, EPF withdrawal, things like that. Maybe that is an area of focus. So uh, before we end the roundtable session today, uh, maybe we can talk about some of the funds and investment products uh, offered by uh, Hong Leong Islamic Asset Management as well as MIDF Amala Asset Management that uh, Mr. Ang and Anjay Aslan could probably recommend to our investors. Uh, I, give way to, yep. yeah, I give way to Jay Aslan first. If, yeah. if Jay Aslan <laughs> thank is you, thank you, Mr. Ang. Always yeah. a gentleman. Anyway, so I will recommend our uh, ESG Mustadama Fund because this year, we uh, maybe this year and next year, we're going to have our new ESG funds, yeah. So our Mustadama fund won the uh, recently won the Edge magazine um, Islamic uh, ESG team fund. We launched it in 2021, and uh, Alhamdulillah, uh, this year our return year to date is about 18 percent. Uh, in August, it was uh, top topping top was at 25 percent year to date. Yeah. So uh, we are inviting investors to look into it. Also. We're launching a new fund uh, by the end of the year or early next year. It's 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 ESG themed as well. Yeah, it's a climate fund. It's called Climate Impact Fund. It it's about uh, us investing in Asia uh, Asia companies where they are targeting all these uh, suppliers to the uh, uh, cost of reducing carbon emissions. Yeah, we are very targeted in that. Very specific. Very interesting. Uh, discoveries that you found. Um, yes, it's, it's filtered via a normal uh, filtration uh, process. However, it's how we per perceive the companies, especially in Hong Kong, especially in uh, uh, China. You know, uh, despite uh, that's why my head is, 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 is in, that, in that mood at the moment. Lah. You know, when it comes to, you know, when I'm still fighting the Asian cause, you know. So, yeah. So we look at that. Me, uh, we we we'll give a shout out. Uh, once uh, we have that package, uh, when SC has approved to that, so uh, look into our Mustafa Rama fund, and you can see itself that the power performance is there. Okay, Mister Ah, over to you. Thank you so much, Jay Aslan. I think our side also um has a few award winning funds and staple funds like Dana Matmo, Dana Matmo ESG funds, and also we are rolling out Dana Dividend. But I think I want to pivot our focus here is basically invest based on your investment philosophy, uh, about based about your 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 principles, 
and uh, do consistently um, stay invested and make sure you have a, a little bit of dry powder by the side, just in case if the market turns. I mean, once my mentor did guide me that it's, it's definitely not a scene to take profits. And if you feel that the market run out has, has still more leg room, you can you stay, can stay uh, maintain your exposure in, 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 in investments. Uh, but more importantly is that don't be afraid to take profits. I mean, uh, if you have run up already, uh, because you know that you can always come back again, right? Uh, when the market turns, right? So always have certain uh, dry uh, powder by the side uh, to look at certain opportunity funds, opportunity stocks itself. And 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 basically is that if, if the going gets tough, right, especially if you look at cyclical, don't be afraid to do certain switching uh, in terms of your strategy. Uh, always have a good uh, periodic review in terms of your investment decision making. And always question yourself uh, because we fund managers and also the Aslan's team also do always question ourselves, right? Our our strategy, our our philosophy, our principles inside, whether our current um, implementation of investment allocations, whether it fits into the current market strategy, whether it fits into current market condition, because right now volatility is the name of the game and we have to be adaptable and, 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 and flexible in certain areas. So that's my uh, small uh, investment uh, guidelines, uh, guidance. Uh. Over to you, Gil. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Asla and Mr. Ang for the insightful sharing. I think it has uh, benefited the investors uh, from the market outlook, the positioning ahead, and finally the product recommendation. Uh, I think we all learned a lot from uh, Mr. Ang and Encik Asla sharing today. I think that's all for today. I think we can wrap our session. Uh, this update is brought to you by Fleet Capital, your partner in finance. See you in the next Philip Roundtable. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kim. Thank you. Thank you, thank, thank you Mr. Ang. See you around. Thank you, thank you Justin.